This is a Witch Space News special report for Friday the 18th of October 2024. I'm Commander Burr. In Elite Dangerous News this week we've had access to the upcoming Ascendancy update and in this video I'll go through our first impressions of both Powerplay 2.0 and the new Zorgon Peterson Mandalay Explorer. If you enjoy our videos consider subscribing to the channel and remember to ding the little bell to make sure you see all our content and community posts and if you'd like to help support the channel links to our Patreon and everything else are in the description below. As part of the Elite Dangerous Content Creator Partners program we were granted access this week to a preview of the upcoming Elite Dangerous Ascendancy update that is landing in the live version of the game in 10 days on the 28th of October as at the time of recording. It was originally intended to launch on the 22nd but in a late breaking development today FDEV have pushed the launch back to the 28th to ensure some fixes to the update can be implemented. Ascendancy is undoubtedly one of the largest, most anticipated and perhaps less well understood of this years editions and whilst it's undoubtedly a complex update it essentially breaks down into two major components. The refresh of the much maligned and, until now at least, underutilised powerplay system called Powerplay 2.0 and the addition of the third of four new ships into the game this year, the Zorgon Peterson Exploration Class vessel, the Mandalay. By design Powerplay requires the input of the player base and their collective will engaging with the system to have any kind of discernible effect and that doesn't happen until the 28th of October. Right now I can however give you some first impressions of the systems usability and how engaging with it has changed and if you've ever engaged with the current version of Powerplay then you'll know that how you engage with it and its usability are actually two of its biggest problems. As a raw example of that usability as part of my work for a power I transported some misinformation about another power from my own powers stronghold carrier fleet to a nearby system that had been targeted for acquisition. It seems obvious if you've never participated in something similar to this in Powerplay 1.0 but loading up the goods for transport in 2.0 was just a case of filling my cargo hold with one simple key press and an on screen progress bar. I won't regurgitate the process here for those unfamiliar with 1.0 but suffice to say it's horrible. Notoriously horrible. 2.0 isn't. It's easy and it's logical. As you may be aware with the current version of Powerplay each of the bubbles power players has exclusive access to a unique module or weapon that cannot be obtained any other way than pledging to that power and using Powerplay. If however you want a different powers modules it means ditching your allegiance and cozying up to another power to get their unique thing and so it goes on and you end up unwilling to be allied to any one power, ultimately utterly defeating the point of power play in the first place. To deal with this particular power play foible version 2.0 aims to do two things. Firstly give you access to all the modules that you wanted under the previous system and secondly give you a reason to be allied and importantly stay allied to a given power. 2.0 attempts to do those things in a number of ways but predominantly certainly when it comes to power play modules it will give you access to all the modules and weapons regardless of what power you are allied to however each power player will grant access to each module in a different order with each one being granted as you level up through that power. Prismatic shields for example you will get from the smurf haired princess first but choose to ally with Nakato Kane who is one of the two reasons so far that the power play portraits are changing with Ascendancy's deployment and you'll instead get a new weapon called the Concord Cannon first. 
with the Smurf Zilla's magic prismo shields not kicking in until you get something like your 7th module reward which comes much deeper into the levelling process. I'd love to be able to tell you at this point what the Concorde Cannon does but I don't know yet and Frontier haven't yet at least made that information available. Power pledging doesn't just get you module rewards of course there are many more benefits like zero rebuy costs with some caveats when you experience power play induced rapid unscheduled disassembly syndrome, a 50% increase in mining commodity profits from your powers space, a 150% increase in minor faction rep gains in your powers space and so the list goes on. So that, in part at least, is some of the why of power play. As for the how of power play that has also been made easier to access and understand. It isn't perfect yet and there are some barriers to cross for the newer power player to overcome in order to work out where you're supposed to be going and what you're supposed to be doing. In that vein however whenever you find yourself in one of the new power play map filters, screens or features you are served fairly liberally with textual context specific information pages a selection of which you can see on screen now. There's a fair bit to read and comprehend if you're completely new to power play but I'd recommend you take the time if you are going to take a stab at it. Once you find the new weekly assignments power play task list which is genius by the way the game then directs you to the various power play specific galaxy map filters and tools to work out where you're going. There is a risk here that the more power play curious but casually inclined players are in danger of stopping dead in their tracks here. It can be somewhat of an informational overload and that would be a shame because the aforementioned newly added power play to do list in particular has the potential at least to kick the rusted shut doors of power play 1.0 off their hinges. Once I connected the dots however and spent a bit of time reading in game manuals it started to click and I got a glimpse at what power play could be about to offer. Your allegiance to a power is not without risk. I did encounter some of the power play enforcement NPC ships that many players had expressed fears about encountering. Not once have I yet been interdicted in supercruise by them but I'm not in a position yet to say that definitely doesn't happen. It just hasn't happened to me personally yet. Having pledged to a power I deliberately parked outside the starport of an opposing power where a patrolling anaconda enforcement vessel was present. It took a good 4-5 to five minutes of me doing literally nothing and waiting for it to see me before it reacted. So based on that I'd say right now at least they are easy to avoid. However once it did react it pursued me with enthusiasm and laser fire until I departed the instance. Stronghold carrier fleets are an entirely different experience however as you'd expect they are crawling with enforcement ships and any detected miscreants are quickly swarmed as well as being fired on by the carrier itself. Overall I'm very happy to say that when compared to the previous generation Power Play 2 is absolutely an improvement over its troubled predecessor and I do think it will see increased engagement from the player base. What level that engagement rests at we'll just have to see but my initial impressions are that pledging to a power shouldn't have any overly egregious effects on gameplay in this first implementation and actually for many might inject a much needed dose of meaning and spice into the overall Elite Dangerous bubble experience. Whilst Power Play 2.0 offers the biggest changes in day to day bubble gameplay for most players right now at least the poster child for Ascendancy is undoubtedly the introduction of Frontiers third next generation SCO capable starship the Mandalay. I won't drill into the module and outfitting information in this video as that information has been out in the wild for some time now. If you want to catch up on that you'll find our video detailing the ships interiors linked on screen right now. 
The only addition to that information is in regard to utility slots which wasn't released until now and I can confirm that there are 4 of the cheeky beggars in Zorgon's new baby. Here's what I can tell you about the Mandalay that I couldn't tell you until I'd strapped one onto me and thrown it about a bit. As Frontier had mentioned it has the jump range you'd want to get you out to the black quickly. I threw together some really lazy badly planned engineering onto an A rated Mandy and it immediately did around 60 light years. If you do it properly and take your time with it I have no doubt whatsoever you'll squeeze an awful lot more out of it. In both regular supercruise and in normal space it manoeuvres like it's trying to impress and is an absolute blast to fly doing everything you'd want it to do when you ask it to do it. It seems to be thermally very efficient. In my lazy engineering build I was fuel scooping in the corona of stars and only just hitting 80% heat as the fuel topped out with fairly regular star sipping at each jump. It felt somewhat dolphin like in that regard at least and I very much appreciate that feature. In Supercruise Overcharge it is an absolute joy. I very quickly got around 4200 times the speed of light and maintained it trouble free without any spin dryer handling and without doing anything meaningful to the fuel tank. It'll get you there and it'll do it very quickly and smoothly. Much has been made of the Mandalay's looks and those clean lines are more than eye catching when seen in game. The ship kit available on day 1 is also one of the best I've seen on any ship in Elite. On the ground the Mandalay sports a rather ungainly appearance, something like a bow legged overweight goose but I have to say I really like that about it and I particularly really enjoyed the contrast to the graceful swan look that the ship takes on when it lifts off. In summary then, it jumps like a condor, handles like a fighter and it looks like a sports car. <laughs> Frontier made much noise about the visibility from the cockpit particularly when it comes to all things exploration. The Mandy's Mamba DNA is most obvious in the canopy and cockpit and that configuration is not a natural fit for exploration, exobio or indeed sightseeing. To appeal to the exploration community's requirements the ship does have some meaningful lighting that floods the area in front of the ship with pop out lights when activated and the glass bottom cockpit section does indeed give a solid view in front of the ship at that specific location. But in terms of anything exploration wise there is simply no beating the glass bubble of the Lacon and despite FDEV's efforts it's in cockpit visibility that the Mandy is at its weakest. You do have a very good view forward, you just don't have a great view looking anywhere else but I certainly don't consider it to be a showstopper. The marketing blurb with the ship has mentioned a couple of times improved ship handling in atmospheric environments or words to that effect. I have to say I haven't noticed anything particularly different handling wise when throwing the Mandalay about. I'm happy to take notes but I've honestly not noticed any ships in Elite handling sufficiently differently enough in atmospheric environments from non atmospheric environments let alone any being better or worse in either medium. It is always possible of course that FDEV are telegraphing a future update opening up different atmospheric environments from those present at the moment and that the Mandy will somehow shine there but until we get any more evidence for that I wouldn't pin any hopes or get excited about anything but it's worth underlining again the Mandy handles beautifully in all environments currently. As was the case with the Type 8 the entrance ramp is fully accessible from the blue tunnel of despair right up to the airlock door. I've yet to be convinced that there is any significance in that but it's very cool nonetheless. There's just no functionality whatsoever once you climb the ramp. Again in lieu of any evidence I'm inclined to not get excited about that. In summary despite a couple of minor gripes quite honestly the Mandalay is absolutely gorgeous to use, fly and look at. 
Rini and I have had plans for some time now to level up an exploration alt each and head out into the black together and the moment we saw the Mandalay we were thinking those alts would be day one purchases for a Mandy each. Having tested it I can confirm that is absolutely solidly now 100% the plan and we can't wait to get started on them. From what you've seen and heard do you think PowerPlay 2.0 is an improvement over 1.0? Will you be jumping into PowerPlay 2.0 when it launches on Tuesday and what plans do you have for the Mandalay? Let us know in the comments below. That's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back later this week with more videos. Until then 07 CMDRs follow the greens on the way out and do keep clear of the toast rack. We very much look forward to seeing you next time.